Okay. Good morning. Uh, for those of you, I've, I've had the opportunity to meet several of you and work with several of you here. My name is Dr. Miller. I'm a perfusionist uh, here at St. Helena Hospital. Just a little background before I got into perfusion. I actually was a nurse for almost 12 years. I was a two-year nurse here at Solano Community College, went to Berkeley, uh, got my first BS in uh, biochem, pre-med, and then uh, my master's in natural sciences. Uh, did nursing for quite a while, then decided to get more in teaching. So I got a job at NASA, worked as a quality control engineer, but I wasn't an engineer, it was a great spot, and helped build uh, components for the space shuttle. Went back to school, decided I wanted to get into either medical school or perfusion school, and one of my great friends at the time, a cardiologist, introduced me to perfusion, and I was like, what is that? You know, went in, uh, because I still was a nurse, and for CEUs, I got the opportunity to watch some cases, and fell in love with it, and here I am today. Um, I went back. I, I'm kind of like one of those Doogie Hauser kids that, you know, I started off, only went to basic grammar school, what you would call for three years, I was homeschooled, never had a high school diploma, had a GED when I was 14, had my associates by the time I was 16, and uh, so it was all, most of my training was all done, you know, with uh, other instructors, and all the kids were always older than me, so it was good, it's beneficial for me. With that said, today we're here to talk about uh, ECMO, and this whole presentation is geared for you nurses in ICU, strictly for you. In fact, a lot of this comes from a, a other program that we were involved in, and uh, most of the time when you're dealing with ECMO, and you're talking 90% of most uh, presentations done on ECMO, you usually have to do a pediatric, but we'll talk about that. So just the, the beginning, like, Nothing in life is to be feared, it's only to be understood. And Murray Curry said that, it's a great quote. Just so you can understand a little bit of my life, and I can understand maybe a little bit about yours. So let's talk about the objectives of this. So we're gonna have a little brief history of perfusion, just talk about how this all happened. Understand the concepts of ECLS. Uh, we're gonna identify the two types of ECLS, veno venous, veno arterial, identify the indications and contraindications for ECLS, identify the roles of the team, and discuss some of the nursing management of ECLS. Most of you have probably never heard of this, but the father of perfusion is Dr. John Gibbon. Dr. Gibbon has already passed away. So we can talk about it in the past tense, but he actually created the first heart and lung machine in 1951, and his wife was a nurse, and she was the first perfusionist to ever work on, on hearts. She wasn't trained, she was just taught by her husband. They did a successful mitral valve repair on their captive seal, and she lived. Uh, the first auctionators at that time were what they call open air oxygenators. And uh, for some of you nurses that have been here for a long time, uh, they used to talk about pump head and all that. Well, that was secondary to the way this, this oxygenator worked. It was nothing more than a fish tank. And you know, now you know how fish tanks go, the bubble go over the top. Well, that's kind of the way it was. Well, as that air goes through, there's a lot of micro bubbles going through their head. And, so that technology wasn't very good, but it was successful at that time. In 1956, Dr. Kamemeyer invented the first membrane oxygenator and, and actually used the same poly membranes that we use today. Um, we still use membrane oxygenators, but we have evolved immensely since then. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more when we get into the ECMO. So this is the father of perfusion. Dr. Robert Bartlett, is known as the father of ECMO, the reason why. In 1972, he successfully maintained a patient for three days 
following the surgery with a ruptured aortic aneurysm. This case was known as the beginning of what we know today. In 1972, they had a Johnson & Johnson auctionator. It was about three meters square, and um, it was considered the, the, the golden standard at that time. The only problem with these auctionators were that they had to be changed out every four to eight hours. So what they don't mention is they had to successfully change out these auctionators because they weren't made for extended use. However, the patient lived, and in 1975, the, both the NIH and the Lung Division of the Heart and Lung Institute started doing studies on ECMO, and at that, that year, the first newborn infant was successfully sustained under ECMO under his care. Does anyone know the name of that baby? You ever heard of her? She's from California. Her name was Esther, and she was a Mexican young lady, and she still lives today. So. Just to let you know a little history. So, ECMO versus ECLS. These terms are synonymous in the sense that um, ECLS is it's kind of confusing. Extracorporeal life support is ECMO. ECMO is, is ECLS. But when we talk about ECMO, we're talking actually about oxygenation. When we talk about ECLS, we're talking about support. So, as you all can read, ECLS has been instituted for emergency situations of life-threatening or pulmonary cardiac failure or both after failure of other treatment modalities. It is used as a temporary support, usually awaiting recovery of organs or as a bridge to definitive treatment. ECLS is not curative. Please remember that. So, some of the indications. We can't come off bypass. Uh, high risk cardiac lab procedures, we're going to be doing some of those pretty soon. Severe cardiac failure due to almost any cause acute coronary syndrome, decompressed cardiomyopathies, myocarditis, and we, we, our last one we had was septic. We had septic shock here, and drug overdoses. Indications for respiratory failure. The big one upstairs, ARDS, it's becoming an epidemic here, and mostly because of H1N1. Do you know that before 2003, we weren't even recording H1N1 cases coming in the United States? We, there were more cases of H1N1 prior to 2003 than there are now. But since this research came out uh, in Australia and New Zealand, they did this study and the reason why we are using this McKay circuit was this study right here. It showed that 75% of the patients had a survival rate while on ECMO with this McKay cardio health system here. So this is why we are really using ECMO for adult patients today. Also trauma, primary graft failure, we don't do lung transplants here. But again, pediatrics is mostly where we're using all this. So, our expected outcomes. Overall support of cardiac and or pulmonary systems allowing time of treatment and recovering from underlying principal diagnosis. ECLS does not treat or cure the underlying process. We just said that a little while ago. So what what do we know about ECLS? It improves coronary blood flow and organ perfusion, and it's a bridge to some form of destination therapy. Every institution will have different criteria for putting putting things <coughs> on. This one comes from ELSO, and these are the list of some of the <coughs> decision-making processes for putting a British patient on. ECMO. So once we decided to put a patient on ECMO, what do we need? Well, we need an ECLS physician, uh, not necessarily a surgeon. Uh, we do have, I believe, now intensivist that has ECMO training that's uh, going for privileges, but we need to have a patient selection, cannulas. Uh, we have to have an order set. <coughs> 
We have to be able to manage the patient. You gotta have perfusion involved. Of course, we have to have you nurses here to assist us doing everything and then respiratory therapy involved. So, it's like being on a colored pulmonary bypass, right? <coughs> Not exactly. Here's a bypass machine. In fact, this is so old that it's scary that I even show you this. Okay. <laughs> this is this is about 15 years old and, and, and years, and that oxygenator is not even being used anymore because it was the worst oxygenator in the world. And that cardioplegia system was actually being used here until I got here. That's how old that cardioplegia system is. But yeah, notice the difference though. See all the different pumps and everything. Okay, so I don't have a pointer on me, but you see. Here, 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 here. You see those? All those are are not part of the ECMO circuit. So this would be cardioplegia and your suckers. And most, I would say 90% of all damage that happens on bypass happens due to the suckers and the vents on bypass. Now this next slide is very small and I apologize. I just wanted to kind of give you an idea of the complications of the bypass. These have been around forever and ever. And I will tell you that we have come a long way from since the beginning of bypass. Uh, the circuits we have now are most of them are coded. And we are doing cases that years ago would take three hours or more and we're doing them in less than two. So a lot of this, I would say the biggest problem still with bypass is the humoral and cellular responses to bypass. The rest are getting better. So let's talk about the cardio health. It's the world's smallest portable cardiopulmonary support system. Before I get any further, thank you. Uh, Leo Moran, as he walks in the door, I, I uh, had the opportunity to meet Leo almost seven years ago. I came here from Florida with a gentleman named Dr. Harold Tabai, who was a very established surgeon from Cleveland Clinic. And Leo uh, pretty much sponsored, helped start a program in Sherlock, build a hybrid and everything. And uh, he was telling me about this ECMO circuit almost seven years ago. He said, man, you can't wait to tell you about the circuit. So here we are, you know, seven years later, we finally got it, but here it is. Well, what makes this thing so special? Very, very simplified circuit. It has a pump and an oxygenator, it's integrated. That means less priming fluid, very important. Met magnetically levitated centrifugal pump. What does that mean? It's centrifugal, it means that there's soft little fingers in the pump that actually push the blood. Opposed to what we used before were positive displacement pumps that actually pushed it, the blood through a sucker. And so you're destroying cells, okay? It takes exactly 250 pounds of negative pressure to destroy a red cell. It takes almost 12 atmospheres of pressure to destroy a cell positively. So, Negative pressures are horrible on blood cells and lysine. So we talked about low pressure drop oxygenator. We could not use any other oxygenator for ECMO besides this McKay Quadrox. The reason for that is the pressure system. I know some of you that we've done ECMO, Bob over here, uh, when you run flows through percutaneous cannulas, you have a higher pressure because of Posey's law. You know, we could go over that, but we don't, we don't have the time. <laughs> the shear forces and pressure in a, let's say my Medtronic filter that I use upstairs is 150 milliliters just at four liters with water. That's just running at four liters. That's how much pressure runs to the oxygen. This Quadrox at four liters is less than 50. So, when we're running those long tubes, femorally, and the smaller tubes going back in the body, 
we would not be able to physically pump into those patients and, uh, and have the oxygenators work without the quad rocks. So you guys understand why the quad rocks. So less shift stress, less playload act activation, better bio capability, and usually we insert it percutaneously. So with all this said, <clears throat> now we get into the dynamics of these CLFs. So you're thinking to yourself, VA versus VB. So anytime you have to do cardiac support, you have to use VA. Respiratory support, if the patient's stable, VB. If they become unstable, VA. If you get a patient that comes in emergency CPR, if they place a patient on ECLS, it will be VA. So what are the dynamics of ECMO? Very simple, actually, when you think about it, it's exactly the same as, as um, bypass. We're pulling blood from the right atrium, right? Sending it through the pump, so it pumps through the oxygenator, and then it returns back via venous circulation or arterial circulation. We're able to oxygenate the blood, we're able to extract carbon dioxide, which is incredibly important, and we, and we can use it as a pump to have the heart rest. This would be a typical VA cannula configuration. This would be your typical VV. Now, notice on the VV, I want to share this with you, because we have done this here, but really no one has talked about it. The ideal positioning for VV would be pulling from the groin. You see this cannula should be almost to the IVC and actually coming back and pumping into the right atrium via IJ cannulation. And, and uh, McKay has those cannulas. They're incredible. And this, this is uh, ideal. And I'll talk to you why this is the way to do it later. This is a typical femoral cannulation. You've all seen this. So, now we're going into the OR for cannulation. And the reason why I have this, this is more for order sets, so that if you guys take this later on and develop policies, this is some of the things that are important uh, to know. Consent, of course, what are we doing? Are we doing, are we doing uh, ECLS or are we doing ECMO? Stat labs, okay, invasive procedures, are we putting in a central line fully, and so forth. I want to make sure you all get a copy of this, so just, uh, you know, write down notes for your head, but I'll, I'll make sure you all get a copy for your notes. Okay, preparing the room. These are things that are kind of common sense, but again, I'm, I'm putting this in your hands, you know. So what do we need? Uh, I don't even know if you guys use the Alaris board. Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, those are what we used before. So if you have a set up like a post-op, pressure cables, you want to have two sets of possible IV pumps in there. Yanker suctions, blood tubing, primary tubing, secondary tubing, and medications, especially a heparin drip available. So now we put the patient on ECMO and we arrive to you guys. And your job would be to settle, settle the patient and the family, of course, because they're all freaking out. Bedside report from myself, the anesthesiologist, to that would say the ECLS, RT and RN, but I don't know you, I don't know if you have that ECLS person uh, yet, but this is our goal. And that person would be taking over the patient. Uh, I would say every institution I've ever worked at, we've always had nurses and RTs run ECMO. Uh, only institutions that I have had perfusions. I mean, we've always been there, but the nurses do a great job, and I'm not trying to put it on any nurses or anything, but uh, usually the nurses want to do it. They're like, hey. And uh, anyways, so this would be uh, where we're at right here. Stat Labs and basically order set, post it on vent, who's on call, who's your intensivist, which surgeon's involved, 
the day and who's your perfusionist. So this is the, here's your scenario that I think that's going to come up. <laughs> your patient is very unstable, and Dr. Dunnington has decided the patient is going to be cannulating the bedside. This has already happened, right? Yes. <laughs> ah! That's probably exactly our case. <laughs> is it right? Yes. Okay. First thing you should do is actually fill your pulse, make sure you're still alive. <laughs> right? Okay. Recommend that you call the nursing supervisor so they can notify the perfusionist. Grab, do you have an ECLS bag? No. Okay. That's another thing. Um, I'm sure Leo and, and uh, they can write to tell you what you should have in one, but you should have one. That'd be a great thing to have now because we're going to be doing more and more of these. Grab an ECLS bag, have perfusions, bring the cardio health card, recruit a buddy. Very important. <laughs> okay, so bedside cannulation, again, just, you know, things that are kind of common sense. You know, patients too unstable to leave ICU, going on IJ cannulation. You know, it, I would like, I, I put ICU needs to make if you don't have one, good to have. A sterile bowl with 500 cc's of, of, of normal saline. Perfusionists will bring cannulas. You sh if you notice, we always have four can uh, four clamps. Do you know why we have four? In case we have to change it out. Boom, 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 boom. On a bypass circuit, we have six. So, but yeah, four cannulas. I mean, four clamps, cannulas. By most of the time, we know the body surface area before we go in the room, so we've already determined the size of the cannula and initiate ECMO. Preliminary orders prior to going on. These are really important. Again, we're not going to spend, you're going to have a copy of this, but this is what we did in other centers. Ask for heparin dose early so you can obtain it from the pharmacy. Does your heparin come or you guys mix it yourself? No, no, no. Okay. We have lots. All right. Bedside cannulation. These are some things from a nursing perspective. What you what you might need. Okay. Supplies. All right. Now here's some things from a nursing perspective. <laughs> Quiet down the room. And again, you, I'll give you all this stuff so you won't have to look at it and go. We can continue the on. And. You know, um, this came up, I want to share this. It says, perfusionists will likely follow PTTs. Okay, if you're first, if we're doing this because a patient crashed, yes, that's true. But if we were already in bypass and we had a patient on heparin, I, I would never go by a PTT. Okay, and I think I've shared this with Bob and a few of you before. When you go on bypass, uh, when you give heparin initial dose, it takes 8 to 12 hours for your PTT INR ratios to come back to normal. So those numbers are not important to me. An ACT is more important to me. Uh, in fact, the best number which I'm trying to get the lab involved is called a rapid tag ACT, which will show us our uh, coagulation with an ACT. And I'm hoping we can start using that technology, but we'll see. So after, place a stat order, your portal of chest x-ray, basically confirm orders. These are all common sense, but things that you might want to consider. So here's a patient supported with VA ECMO. You can see here that this is an old system. They don't have the, the new cardio health, but they have the quad rocks, and they have it so pump out here. So that will be for the quad rocks. Typical VA, you can see the differences in color of blood. See the red and the blue. And I like to, I like these, Leo. I don't know where they get those from, but those are really cool little strap deals. <laughs> we have the ones that you sew. Yeah. yeah, I like to get those. Those are really cool. Okay, distal leg perfusion. Now, we have not seen this phenomenon yet, but this is going to happen. In fact, I think I was working a case with Bob, and this happened. And we should have done this. So this is referred to SFA. And what they do is they provide a shunt line 
so that your distal leg uh, becomes you know, oxygenated, and it happens very frequently. Um, but because the patient is under anesthesia, the biggest sign of a, a leg that is ischemic is what? Pain. But they're sedated, so they can't tell you they're having pain. So later on, it shows you some things about uh, how, how to treat that. Here's a patient on ECMO. So monitoring, very important. Cardiac output, keep our indexes above two. You guys know that. Um, vasoactives have our means above 55. Blood gases, looking at lactate levels. I'm sure the perfusionists tell you every time they do a monitor setting, if they don't, let me know. And PT, heparin, and ch check for bleeding and oozing, SPO2, and, SP and SPO2. Now, it says they're BA, ECLS. Why do you think we measure in the right arm and the, the forehead? Do you guys do cerebral sets? No. May I see them? Okay. That would be recommended, and we'll get into that. But any idea why we would use a right arm and forearm? It's more accurate than the left arm because the way it's reheating. That's very good. It actually, your right arm, when you're cannulated, it's less oxygen than any other part of your body. So by looking at your your SP, SPO2 on your right arm, it's more accurate. It'll tell you your lowest number. And your forehead, because of this next next figure here, the brachiocephalic or IE anominate is the last uh, vessel when you're going retrograde flow that gets oxygenated. So it's good if you're going backwards, your posterior and anterior communicating arteries are not getting enough flow. So if you have a way of monitoring cerebral sets, it's very good. So the, I'm going to try to incorporate that in your ECLS uh, protocol as well. Labs. Okay. I'm not going to bore you. Here we go. So these are the labs you want. Biggest thing is to keep a hemoglobin above 10, um, so ECMO works. <coughs> These colors are beautiful, aren't they? They're the St. Helena colors. <laughs> I, I, uh, I had to change this out. My wife said, no, honey, they have to be St. Helena's colors. So, oh my goodness, here you go. I can't even see the one on the right, I'm, I apologize. Q4 hours, uh, for 24 hours, then Q12. And then your metabolic panels and so forth. Can I ask you a question? Sure. On the Q4 hours for 24 hours and Q12, that's if they stabilized? Yes. Okay. Basically, again, these are ELSO's guidelines. Right. Um, but uh, those were the, were the guidelines that we used. But I guess it would be position driven. But yes, that's, that, that would be why. Correct. Thank you. So, ECLS care 24 hours. Kind of change a little bit, okay? Keep going for the sake of time. Hemostasis, you guys have done a great, great job on this. Bleeding, oozing at sites, you want to hold manual pressure. Uh, quick clots or V pads may be needed around cannula, central lines, avatine around the sites. Don't pull or puncture if you don't have to. Okay, so dressing change to cannula sites. Again, you guys are great at this. Just some guidelines for doing so. So now we get into the actual guidelines from ELSO, talking about hemodynamics. So on VA support, SVO2 can be used as a guide to monitor hemodynamic management, right? But VV support, this is the deal when Bob and I had the case on VV, we're like, so what do we look at? Well, you're you should be looking basically, I tell you the most important way of managing patients on VD support is echo. Um, because echo will tell you what the heart is doing. And that's really important. If we're, if we're emptying the heart, if we're not, and making sure that our index is above two. Other than that, um, you know, we're, we're gonna looking at our venous gases. Ideally, well, let's, we'll talk about that. So what you should see, right? When your machine's working, called deferential hypoxia, should be seen. You should see pink toes, blue head, 
And again, if we can, monitor pulse oximetry on right finger and the forehead or forehead. Sedation, these are ELSO's, uh, what ELSO recommends. And again, whatever our order set is, I'm just showing you what they recommend. Ventilator management. Again, for the sake of this, this is for ventilation for RT. And going on this, blood gas. So, BV, ECLS, PCO2 of 42, PO2 of 40, and SATs of 80. That's pretty much what we saw. Mm -hmm. um, if your crit is above 40 and your cardiac function is good, systemic oxygenation delivery would be adequate at this level of hypoxemia. And don't increase vent settings from rest settings because of hypoxemia. We, we were doing this, do you remember? They kept changing the vent settings. I kept saying, why are we changing the vent settings? There, this, is, this is why we need to have these standards. Recirculation. So this is the phenomenon that I was talking about earlier. What happens in recirculation is you are, when you're, you're, most of the time it happens during VV cannulation, but what happens is you're sucking blood from, say you go femoral to femoral, and what happens is you just make this big loop and the rest of the body is not being oxygenated. You get into, your organs start failing, uh, and you get into, first thing you see, your lactates are going to start going up, and you're going to say, wow, why am I getting so acidotic? Well, this is what's happening. So, normally, we had this happen. We had Dunnington change the cannula, because I thought it might have been too high. And then we, we did some other things. We changed the pump speed. The cannula was draining fine. Uh, but what we really should have probably done is had some form of a SFA or another form of oxygenation for the lens and so forth. But again, those were that was our number three, and uh, we're still learning at this center. Uh, here are some other guidelines. Respiratory therapy, chest PT. We haven't really done that, I don't think, have we? And uh, now we finally have flow land. Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, I don't think you should ever even start an ECMO program without flow land, uh, but we have not. We've had the, the little respirators, but we haven't had the medication, but I was told it's been finalized, so we have it. Flow land, for the, those of you who don't know, it's a very potent vasodilator for people who have high uh, pulmonary vascular resistance. And most of our patients who are going to ECMO have this, this problem. Do you know if they used it on the IV form on the bed 9 yesterday? Oh, they did. Did they finally get it? I, I have no idea. I, I wasn't here yesterday. I just got back from my daughter's wedding, so, yeah. He was old 12, now he's 29. He was once. No, he wasn't, but his oh, he ate great before that night. High low flow. He didn't survive. Okay, I knew they had made him. So, our volume management, extremely important on any form of ECMO or ECLS. Um, you, you've seen that when we had the patient who was septic, we were so volume overloaded, we kept trying to take the volume off. But our ideal goal is, you know, if you have to give fluids, give albumin, you know, and again, uh, just kind of manage it, your eye and nose closely and uh, basically make sure if the patient is in renal failure, you have some form of dialysis going on and I'm trying to keep their electrolytes normal. Okay, so LV distension. This is a phenomenon that happens uh, mostly on VA, all right? And we have not seen this yet, but we will. So what happens to this is usually a patient who just had a incredible MI, uh, fresh MI, and an LV, we go in, do like cabbage times four, can't come off pump, and you're going on ECMO, 
and you keep, the heart's just inflating, inflating, inflating. So what do you do? Well, the ideal first thing to do would be a balloon pump. Why would you think a balloon pump would be? Anyone? Why would you think balloon pump would work? Decrease afterload. Decreases afterload. Okay. So you're trying to unload the LV. So a balloon pump would be perfect for that, right? Because you're you're wanting the heart to eject, right? Because if we don't eject, you're going to have more pulmonary hemorrhage. So a balloon pump would be idea. Would an impella be good? No, not for decreasing afterload. Very good. I, 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 people don't understand uh, the benefits of Impella, but Impella would not work in this situation. Uh, if I, if balloon pump would be idea. The next thing would be do to, to add would be inotropes. Give them your milrone, give them some pressors, and try to increase their cardiac output that way. But I, balloon pump is the first stage. And they would catch that on echo, and this is the basically the, the criteria that that has to be met in order to see you know to follow this so renal nutrition we just talked about that anticoagulation very important pepper bolus before cannulation uh, most of the perfusionists are pretty paranoid about that but just in case it's an emergency make sure that the heparin is given all right, and you want to, uh, PTT, again, if this is a patient going on ECMO, not coming from bypass, and determined by perfusionists and your doctors. Infection and antibodies. Okay. Positioning. All right. Is patient stable? Can you turn, tolerate turning? Ideal turn every two hours. You guys did a great job on this too. I know the it, it drove the perfusionist crazy because the volume shifts went on. But you know, unable to tolerate, document, document, document. Is there any plans to start making it like policy to put them on a special bed? The, I, the I, I brought that up already. Um, again, I'm pushing this stuff, and hopefully they can see this because this comes right from ELSO. And if we can show them guidelines that everyone else is using, they might go, "Wow, you know." Uh, I figured here at um, this beautiful hospital, you kind of have to do things in a nice way. So this is my way of doing it nicely. GI bleeding, it happens, and. The worst case scenario, if we come, if we have to come off bypass, have to have the system ready to go, you know, as soon as the patient is able to go back on, we go back on. So this is what we talked about earlier, distal limb ischemia. It's also known as compartment syndrome. You guys have seen this before on regular patients who have had just you know, uh, clots and so forth. But so we talk about this, it's due to decreased uh, arterial flow and return. And the five classic signs we mentioned, pain, pallor, pulses, par parathesis. I can't say that word, paresthesia. Paralysis. And the only pain is commonly associated with this syndrome, but you can't ask them. So, your examines, you should look at wood-like feeling of the extremity and pain with passive stretch muscles and the affected compartment. Monitor closely, do not elevate, okay? And again, very generalized things that you guys probably would do already. Dressing changes. Make sure the perfusion is there. <coughs> doesn't freak out when you move the lines mm -hmm. and you requ it requires a physician order oh. dressing change at cannulation access site so not using non sterilized removal dressing by carefully pulling toward the insertion site not away okay 
Now it's getting hot in here, huh? Each of us weaning. So now we're at the point where we're weaning. Increased pulsatility on our arterial tracing. Our echocardiograph evidence of recovery. Optimize our inotropes. All right. Can the lungs work? So we gradually wean down to one liter per minute. And it's, it's not necessary with VV, you can just turn off. And can you, you can intermittently clamp bridge if bridge is present. Decannulation. Heparin is turned off 30 to 60 minutes before. And so far the only ones we've had have all been deaths, unfortunately. But uh, they say to leave the cannulas in. Uh, for autopsy or so forth. I think that's the next one. Oh, this is good here. Removing venous cannula. Okay, be really careful when they do so because air can enter through the side holes. These new cannulas we have have holes all through them. And the reason for those holes is that it helps drain better. So when you go to uh, remove the venous cannula, they want the patient to uh, valsalva or use the ventilator. <coughs> Pardon? <coughs> that would be something nurses would be doing? Yeah. No, no, yeah. just, just, just a rule of thumb. <laughs> so if you guys remember, like when the doctor's, when the doctor's doing this, say, hey, make sure you valsalva. <coughs> okay. Post CCS. <coughs> so this, this is, uh, this is very, very scary, but this is true. So be careful, 10% of, of post-ECLS patients die in hospital stay in the ICU off the vent in the, within the first 24 hours. And if you think they have a DVT, you know, let them, you know, let the docs know and put an IVC filter. And it's not uncommon to come off with a fever. And that's just your body's fighting again. Your, your, your body's going through this autoimmune change. And it's not, a, I mean, it's not uncommon to see a patient be febrile on when we go on any ECLS as well. Stopping support but no longer effective. This is uh, something that, again, every hospital is going to be different. Uh, but these are kind of no-brainers, you know, when we should stop ECLS. But there's, these are guidelines so that we can show our surgeons and staff. Withdrawal. Okay. Like I said before, you send the patient to the morgue and can't in place. Transporting in-house, we really don't do a lot of this, but again, these are criteria that we should implement. Transporting what we should have. Transporting in house, if so. Transporting in general, my role. <clears throat> okay, here's some of the roles of individuals RT, maintain vent airway management, responsible, of the, if you guys are responsible for the care of the ECLS patient, additional nurse could clear the hallways. That would be helpful. So, emergencies, hemostasis. We've already seen that. We did very well with that. Emergency uh, medications. Normally, when you are shifting a patient on ECMO, we've seen this just moving a patient. What happens? Pressure drop. You have to have pressors available. So, always be aware of that whenever you move patients, they're, you know, they're volume shunting. Have your basal active agents on. Those are the guidelines on ELSO. 
keeping our mean above 55. And monitoring, uh, you guys have CERN here? Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I, I thought so. So just monitoring and documentation and CERN, SCO2 and, and lactate levels. I think we, we all, you had a few other criteria you were looking at, uh, I believe that you guys are monitoring and Dr. Dunnington was looking at every 15 minutes or so. Documentation of arterial cannula site. This patient has a 21, whatever the cannula size was. Venous cannula. Daily probes, okay. This is, this, these are little things that nurses, those are your pearls, assess your sutures after every turn. Remember after diuresis, sutures can become loose. You must have someone perfusion monitoring cannula during turning sites, daily chest x-rays, a bovie. Why a bovie? Do they even do that? Do they bring bovies in? They, probably not. Mm -hmm. The reason why you want to have a bovie is you don't want to cut anything. They have bleeding, more bleeding going on, right? Gentle suctioning. Okay. We do have a bovie available. Do you? Have this? <laughs> this is an incredible video. Karen, I recommend that you get this for the surgeons and for the team. But this is a, uh, it shows cannula, cannulation methods that, that are, re, you know, requested by uh, a lot of the companies running any form of ECMO, both on babies and adults. These are the references. Again, I'm gonna give you copies of all this stuff. And these are, most of these are guidelines for just nurses and for ECMO and, and ACL, ECLS. So, the little girl on the left, I, I didn't tell you this story, so I'm gonna tell it at the very end. And uh, I used to do a lot of medical missionary work in Haiti. The little girl on the left, I went down, and this was in 1998. She had transposition great vessels, and she had uh, no IVC, so we had to do transposition of great vessels, and we did a Fontaine procedure, it's called a Norwood stage one. <clears throat> she survived the procedure, and we had to put her on ECMO. She was on ECMO for 45 days. Mm. I treated her, uh, she came in through, I did the actual heart surgery, with the team and uh, uh, at Tampa All Children's. And that's a picture of her at seven years old. She lived. I went back to see her in the village. I was like, where's she at? <laughs> Dirty face and all, but she survived. So ECMO works. Um, I thank you for your time. I, I know it's a lot of uh, information, but most of it again is for you so that we can set up some sort of uh, standards and policies uh, for your unit.